The psalmist calls us to worship this morning with these words from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of honor and majesty in his work, and his righteousness endures forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. And now let us praise and give thanks to our God as we sing together hymn number 11. Now thank we all our God. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and God's truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, our God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hearing that promise of Scripture, let us now come to our prayer of confession as corporately we confess our sins. Let us pray. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, in finding in you our refuge and strength. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, amen. And now let us bow our heads individually and silently, confessing our personal sins to God. Amen. 
The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. The mercy of our Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian. I invite you to reach for one of the friendship pads located on the center aisle. Please sign and pass the pad along the pew, acknowledging those who are in worship with you this Sunday morning on the pew. A special welcome as well to those of you who worship with us by way of WYED TV. We are thankful for your presence with us in this service of worship. We are thankful that we are the beneficiaries of your participation, of your prayers, and of your financial contributions to this very special ministry. We are First Presbyterian in Raleigh, North Carolina, located across from the state capitol, and we are thankful that you worship with us each Sunday at this hour. For those of you who are guests in the sanctuary, we invite you to stay for a few minutes at the close of the service. Uh, there will be a congregational meeting, and so the close of the service will be uh, somewhat longer, but. Uh, we do invite you to stay for coffee in the Balkan parlor. The pastors, after we greet at the doors, will go to that room, and we look forward to greeting you who are here this Sunday morning. If you are looking for a church home, we invite you to join with us in Christian discipleship. There is a place to check on the friendship pad, your interest in getting information, as well as your interest in becoming a member. And if you desire detailed information, there is an officer present in the Anderson Session Room each Sunday who is prepared to talk with you about how one becomes a member by transfer of letter, reaffirmation of faith, or by profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. Call to your attention the announcements in the worship bulletin. There is a congregational meeting which is at the close of this service. For the purposes listed in the worship bulletin and limited to that, to receive the annual report of the session, to endorse the budget as approved by the offices and to approve any changes and call the pastors to be forwarded to the presbytery. We are receiving uh, still this Sunday uh, registrations for the all-church retreat at Montreat, North Carolina. We have approximately uh, 275 individuals who have pre-registered, and there is still room for you if you register uh, today for this uh, weekend 48-hour retreat in Montreat, North Carolina. We are uh, <clears throat> receiving our reservations this Sunday for the first church night supper, which is this uh, Tuesday evening beginning at 6.15, and there will be more about that in a moment for mission. The focus of the supper is on international missions, and Dr. David Jenkins is our speaker. After the first worship service this Sunday, we acknowledged uh, the valuable service of Dee Campbell and Lisa Clevenger Nance. Dee Campbell served for 15 months as our minister's assistant for visitation, and Lisa Clevenger Nance as our interim director of uh, coordinator for Christian education. Beginning of February the 1st, Martha Moore and Patricia Wallace will be the minister's assistant for visitation, and beginning February the 1st, we welcome Mrs. Uh, Sheila Spruill Barrack as our new director of Christian education. At this time, it's my privilege to call on Dr. Douglas Hammer, a member of the Mission Committee, who brings our moment for mission on behalf of the special offering to be received uh, next Sunday on international missions, and as well on behalf of our first uh, church night supper this Tuesday night on international missions. Doug Hammer. Good morning. I'll tell you what I told everybody at first service, Please be careful driving home. It's getting colder out and it's going to be slippery. 
What I neglected to mention is the game's not going to start for another six hours, so you have plenty of time. <clears throat> Next Sunday is going to be World Mission Sunday. Last year, our church gave over $4,000 to World Missions. Tuesday, February 1st, is our Global Mission Dinner. The Mission Committee has two dinners every year. We have a Global Mission Dinner, and then we have a Local Mission Dinner. Now, unfortunately, we haven't gotten as much publicity as we usually get for the Global Mission Dinner. It's going to cost $4, and you can make reservations by using either a purple or a yellow card. They're two different color cards that are in your pews, or by calling the church office by Monday evening. <clears throat> there will be a nursery there. Now, our speaker is going to be Dr. David Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins was a pastor in Goldsboro for 14 years and with the past five years has been with the Medical Benevolence Foundation. The Medical Benevolence Foundation is basically the missionary arm of uh, PCUSA. We have over 70 hospitals and over 1,000 clinics worldwide. Last year, we treated over 3 million patients. Let me try to give you some idea of what this is like. In our country, when we look at per capita expenditures for health care, when we look at health care plans that are being bandied about now, people are looking at costs in the range of 3,000, 4,000 maybe <coughs> per capita. In many of the countries where our people serve, where our clinics and hospitals are, the per capita expenditures for health care are often a couple of hundred dollars. There's some countries when they're less, where they're less than a hundred dollars. In some of these countries, a couple of dollars per capita a year makes a difference of whether children get immunized against childhood diseases that we don't even worry about anymore, or whether people have clean water to drink in their villages. So our work is really important. And for every, I think I've said this before, but for every missionary that's overseas, they need 100 people like us to support their work. The Medical Benevolence Foundation, and, and another thing, just let me mention, uh, is that we actually support missionaries who live in Nepal now. Ron Stringer and his wife, Linda, and their two children. I was fortunate enough to meet them last March in Louisville. They had come back from Zaire, where it was physically dangerous for missionaries to be. He was on furlough for a while here in the United States, and now he and his wife and children are in Nepal serving the Lord. The Medical Benevolence Foundation serves and um, <clears throat> secures excellent used medical equipment and supplies and sends them to these hospitals and clinics all over the world. It augments the PCA International Mission collections that the church gets, and it augments that budget in, other, in order to send more medical personnel overseas. It coordinates volunteers to serve in the field and that these periods of time can be anywhere from two weeks to several months. In, in getting volunteers, it permits people who are in the field as full-time missionaries to go on furlough or to get further medical or, or nursing or dental or dietary training. We have a strong and vital and wonderful heritage in medical missions, which allows for evangelism worldwide. I would really encourage you, if you've not been to it before, to come to the Global Mission Dinner Tuesday night. Dr. Jenkins is a good speaker. The food is good. The fellowship is good. I would like to close today with a prayer from our old friend, the Mission Yearbook for Prayer and Study. For those of you uh, who have a copy, you'll know that this week it really discussed the Synod of Alaskan and Northwest. And actually, the moment for mission today is for Native Alaskans. The prayer for dedication is based on the scripture, scripture of Mark, which you will hear shortly. Let, us, let me pray. God of infinite power, we stand under your authority, ready to learn your ways and do your will. Help us to quiet the evil in our world, to turn that which is destructive toward the light of your love. Use us and the gifts we bring to teach authority with the ways of truth and peace so that your good news may spread throughout your world. Amen. Thank you, and I hope to see all of you Tuesday night.
reading verses 15 through 20. The great leader of Israel, Moses, is speaking to the children of Israel, and he delivers these words promising a great prophet who would come to tell the word of God. Hear this passage of scripture. The Lord our God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. We continue our reading of scripture from the gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 21 through 28, as we consider for our sermon topic, the power of a prophet. We begin on the first day of the first week of Jesus' public ministry. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his, at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. May God bless to our reading and to our understanding this passage of Scripture. The word of the Lord, thanks be unto God. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we gather for worship this Sunday, at the close of this first month of 1994, that we be guided by the strength of your spirit so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts may be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus comes into Galilee. It's like D-Day. Historians here, those of you who know history, know from whence came D-Day as a name which describes the beginning of the end. D-Day, for Jesus and for the kingdom of God. Sheer awesome power was felt on that day in June, June 6, 1944, the earth shook, the sky exploded, and friend and foe alike were awed at the smell and the sound. For it was the largest amphibian invasion ever which hit the shores of France on June the 6th, 1944. It was D-Day, and there was fierce resistance. Mark in our gospel presents the spiritual campaign of Jesus to liberate us from the forces of sin and death, 
from any forces which cripple the, the human spirit, which demeans life, which crushes life. It is D-Day, and it is launched in Galilee. Divine power is manifested, and there will be fierce resistance to this power. There will be fierce resistance to the coming of the kingdom of God. But yet, the spiritual gauntlet of spiritual power, God's love present in power in Jesus, acts on behalf of you and me as Jesus goes into battle for you and me. The good news is that God's Messiah has come. The Gospel writer Mark frames this small section of Scripture as well as the entire Gospel with a statement early on in this first chapter, verse 14. And he writes, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of the Gospel and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. D-Day. And the Gospel writer, Mark, announces it takes place in Galilee. Well, a question is posed by this Gospel writer, Mark, for us. How do you and I respond to the power of Christ? How do you and I respond to the power of this Messiah? How do you and I respond to the power of this Christ, a prophet unto Moses. You know, it makes a huge difference to be claimed by the right kind of power, the right kind of power which gives life stability, which gives life security so that we find meaning and purpose, a power which does not diminish life, a power which does not demean life, a power which does not destroy life. It makes a huge difference what kind of power claims us to give us security, to give us meaning. We had an interesting conversation with my daughter-in-law. It was beginning of the first term of kindergarten for our oldest grandchild, Amanda Blaine, who's a very shy little girl. It took a lot of parental love and affirmation upon affirmation to get her into the right frame of mind to, to start kindergarten, five-year-old kindergarten. She did very well, but then Christmas came and she got used to the security of home, of playing with her younger brother Evan and her baby sister Sloan, and it was the first day of the new term, and she walked outside to stand in front of the door. Well, the school bus was late to pick her up. Well, what did she do? Insecure about all this, so she turned around and walks into the house and announces to her mother, I'm not going to school today. The school bus is late. Well, fortunately, the, the school bus driver saw her turn and walk back into the house, and by the time the bus was turned around and heading back, little Amanda was there with her mother. Parental love, affirming again, affirming again, giving her power and security to do what she needed to do. It makes a huge difference what kind of power claims us to give us security and meaning. Members with whom I have prayer before an operation claim power, and it gives them security. Before an operation, members claim the power of their surgeons and of the surgical team. They claim, in an amazing way too, the power of their God to give them security to go through that operation. It makes a huge difference what kind of power claims us to give life meaning and purpose and security. So it is D-Day, and power is manifested. Jesus enters Galilee in a blitzing action. It is the first day of the first week of his public ministry. And he goes to the synagogue at Capernaum. Now, Mark does not tell us the content of Jesus' teaching, but what he relates, though, is how what Jesus said was felt and heard by those the observers that day in the synagogue. They are simply astounded at the authority and the power of this individual who speaks with such conviction that he far surpasses the authority and the power of any scribe they ever heard, one of the learned doctors of the law. 
The power of Jesus' words spoken with conviction, Mark relates, awes him. They can only say, what is this? It's an authority and a power which resonates with something deep inside them. Deep, deep inside their religious memory. It resonates with something deep in their heritage memory. It resonates with something deep in their scriptural memory. For what they hear that day reminds them of one who is to come in the tradition of Moses as a prophet, the par excellence, the one who comes as the Messiah in the tradition of the prophet, who acted with God's word and actions to liberate people. It makes a huge difference what kind of power claims one. And these individuals experiencing the power of Jesus that day in the synagogue sense that there is here one present who models, who models the prophet par excellence. And they are seeing it and hearing it themselves. The text read this morning by Jim Ella from Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 20, gives us the biblical background of this one who was to come unto Moses. In Jewish literature, there is this expectation that the one who comes, comes in the tradition of Moses, who is to be the Messiah, who speaks with God's word and God's actions. In the Qumran community, which produced what we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls, a whole library of some 800 plus volumes sealed in clay vessels for, for centuries and centuries, there is an exposition of Deuteronomy 18 which says that the one who is to come, comes to herald the eschatological kingdom of God. It is to be the beginning of the end because of this power. The power of the one who comes unto Moses, the one who comes as Messiah to liberate, to save people from bondage. So Jesus announces on this D-Day, this spiritual campaign, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And undoubtedly, that is the content of what was explained in a much more detailed way there in that synagogue at Capernaum. What is going on here? What is going on here is for you and me good news. And the Christian church has captured this good news in many wonderful ways. Here in the chancel is depicted here in stained glass, the scripture readings this morning. On the one hand, Moses. On the other hand, Jesus. Jesus, the one who was foretold, comes in power to liberate us from sin and death. The one who comes unto Moses as a prophet with power to be God's Messiah. Moses who acted to liberate people from bondage is now represented in Jesus, who is God's Messiah, is to liberate us from sin and death, from anything which cripples the human spirit. Mark gives us an answer to the question raised by these observers who ask, what is this? Meaning, in a sense, who is this? And the answer comes from a most unlikely source, because there is a story within the story here in this very short passage. There is the account of the people being awed at the authority and power of Jesus, which resonates with something deep down inside them. But then there's another story here, too. Did you catch it when we read it? There's another story. The gathered assembled asks the question, but there is a person there who responds who knows exactly who it is, who knows exactly who it is. And his answer is like what's going to happen this afternoon or this evening, I guess it's 6 o'clock. His answer is like a perfect 50-yard strike to a Michael Irving or to a Billy Brooks, depending upon which team you favor in the Super Bowl this evening. His answer is on target. He gives an answer. But he is a person who is pre presented as having an evil spirit, a demon. And the word demon means one who causes harm. In Jewish literature, they identified over seven million demons. 
And this individual representing the force of evil acknowledges who Jesus is because the person of Jesus threatens all the power represented by evil. The statement made by this person giving the name is an attempt to get control. Because in biblical literature, if you can give the name, you got control. And the person with the evil spirit does give the name to get control. It's like when you're sick and you go into the hospital and you've got this unknown infection. And all these tests are run and nobody knows what it is. Nobody can get a handle on it. And finally, the test result comes back. And it is identified as a certain kind of bacteria. There's a name to it. And with the name, with the name comes control. With the name comes an ability to control it and to destroy it with antibiotics. And so Mark is picturing here this individual attempting, representing evil, to get control of Jesus. He says, I know who you are. You have come to destroy us. You are the Holy One of God. Well, in Jewish literature, there are, in, in that day, in the day scholars tell us, manuals written, elaborate manuals in terms of rites of exorcism and incantations which a person can use to exorcise an evil spirit. But what does Jesus do? He simply says, be still and come out of him. Again, it is power unprecedented by the observers. Power unprecedented. But it's God's way. God's way through Jesus in that moment to give a foretaste of what is going to be accomplished in Jesus' death on the cross. It's the beginning of the end for sin and death here. That day in that synagogue, it is D-Day. Many battles are yet to be fought. Yes, Jesus must die on the cross and be raised, but it is God's way of releasing a divine power to liberate us from anything which cripples the human spirit. It is releasing of God's power on our behalf to give us life over sin and death. It's good news. Good news for us who can claim it today. But the question needs to be asked in light of this passage of Scripture. What are the modern day demonic powers? What are the modern day demonic powers that we need to be saved from by the power of Jesus as Messiah? What are the modern day demonic powers that we need to be saved from by the power of Jesus as Messiah, as the prophet unto Moses, who acts with God's word and acts with power. It's ironic, is it not, that the context of the good things of life contain in them the seeds of destruction if they are misused. The good gifts of life are given to us by God, but if these good gifts of life are worshipped rather than the source of the good gift, the good gifts of life when are worshipped out of context become the source of the seeds of our own destruction. They can become the modern day demonic powers in which sin can destroy life. Sexuality is a gift, a good gift of God. But the exploitation of sexuality outside of the biblical pattern, whether it be promiscuous, hetero, or homosexual acts, dehumanizes the human being. For to exploit another for sexual gratification, is to calm, ha cause harm to self and to others. It is to be possessed by a power which harms a demon. Material things are goods. There are goods given to us by God. It is, it is well to have the income to clothe ourselves, to educate our children, to rent an apartment, or to, to, to purchase a home, to purchase a ticket to, to the symphony or to the ballet, to buy a book. These are good gifts. But if these good gifts are worshipped as materialism and are pursued as things we must control to give security to self, they become a demon which destroys. Pride is a gift. To have pride in oneself as a child of God, loved by God, 
is to have worth, to love God with all your heart, soul, soul mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Proper self-love is to affirm that we are made in the image of God and that no one can take that away from us. We are children of God. We have worth. And that gives us a certain sense of self-esteem. Thus, to have pride in how one looks, one's institutions that you favor, an institution, a school, or whatever. To have pride in one's ethnic origin. You know, I'm a German, or I'm a Scot, I'm a Frenchman, I'm an Englishman, I'm a Native American, or whatever. But, but, to elevate self as superior over another out of vain pride is another matter. It's to misuse, misuse the gift of who we are. And it leads to the seeds of sin that can justify ethnic cleansing for racial or ethnic or religious grounds. It's a demon which destroys. Successes are good to develop one's potentialities, to use the gifts given to us by God to be the best we can be, to be the best student, to be successful in marriage as a spouse, to have a relationship which is healthy and whole, to be a successful secretary, doing the best. To be successful is to open avenues of leadership for the common good, because the common good is benefited by the fact that we attempt to maximize God-given potentialities. And so success is a good. But to pursue success and status as an end in itself, to worship it, is to exploit others and to step on others and over others. It becomes a demon which destroys. The list can go on and on and on and on. For the areas given to us by God as good gifts to be used as stewards are numerous. But when abused, when abused, they can become the new seven million demons. The occasion for sin, which separates us from God, puts us in bondage. The good news of the gospel is that we can be those to be claimed by a different power rather than this kind of power. The power we claim in Jesus Christ is a power which enables us to use the good gifts of life in the right way. It's a power which enables us to resist temptation. It's a power which heals us when we do fall into these traps of bondage. This is why the gospel is good news. Of God's love which comes, came that day in Galilee, it's D-Day. And we who are in worship this day claim that it is not only D-Day back then, but we, because of what God has done for us through the crucifixion, the resurrection, experience Victory Day. Because when we acknowledge who it is who has done this and respond in faith, it's not to get control over Jesus by saying, you are the Holy One of God. It is to allow God and Jesus to get control over us and to reign in our hearts and our minds that we might have security and power to taste life fully and to know that nothing can cripple the Spirit. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, Paul writes in his epistle to the Romans, because of a love which has reached out to us to free us from sin and death, and from any demonic power which would cause us harm, the occasion of sin. So the question posed to us by Mark, how do we respond to the power of Jesus as Messiah? Is an important one for each one of us to answer. For to answer, you are the Holy One of God, is to claim that power for us which frees us from any form of sin and death. To claim that answer is to claim that power which acknowledges that nothing can cripple our spirits. To claim that answer is to claim that by our faith in Christ, we indeed enter the kingdom of God. We enter because we have been freed from the bondage of sin and death just as Moses acted under the power of God to free those Israelites out of slavery in Egypt to say you are the Holy One of God, the Christ, the Messiah, is to acknowledge that because of Jesus Christ, every day is Victory Day. And it is to live with that kind of power now and forever. Amen.
Scripture indeed reminds us that we are free in Christ. And we attest to that when we say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. Let us stand now and say that together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time, let us come together with our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, from whom comes all good and every perfect gift, we praise you for your mercies. We praise you for your goodness that has created us, for your grace that has sustained us, your discipline that has corrected us, your patience has borne with us, and your love that has redeemed us. Help us to love you and to be thankful for all your gifts by serving you and delighting to do your will. Indeed, God of all mercies, we give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this in our lives. But above all, we thank you for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world through your Son, Jesus Christ. For by the means of grace and the hope of glory, we trust in you. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but also in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all of our days. We pray all these things through Jesus Christ, to whom you, through your spirit, live in honor and glory with us, was born of Mary and shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Leading his followers, he guides us. Dying on the cross, he rescues us. Risen from the dead, he gives new life. In Jesus Christ, we know your spirit is with us. Send us your Holy Spirit, that your people may become one. Unite us in faith, inspire us to love, and encourage us with hope. That being made one with Christ, we may be one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in his final victory. But God, as much as we come before you with thanks, we also lift up our prayers of concern to you this day. For each of us knows those times in our lives when we fear and have worry and no doubt. We ask that you deal with these things and take them from us. Help us to know that your presence can make many things right that we know not of, that you protect us at times we're even unaware Dear God, we each know those times in our lives when we face the odds that seem to be against us, when the world seems to press too close and too hard that we need your strength. We ask for that strength and that assurance that through you we can conquer all things. For those who face death near them, them that of their own life or that of someone around them, give them comfort and compassion. Remind them that Christ, through his victory on the cross, has conquered even death itself, and that through that we may know newness of life. Almighty God, each of us feels pain in our lives, whether it be of illness or injury or pain of the Spirit. We ask that you heal us through your Son, Jesus Christ. 
Grant us victory in what he has done for us, that once again we might know not just your presence, but that the future is bright through Christ. Dear God, all these things and more we bring before you this day, praying as we have been taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Having received so richly from God's hand, let us now bring forth our tithes and our offerings. Let us bring before God the gifts of our lives and our labors. Gracious God, our Father, we bring you these gifts and ask that as you receive them, you receive our lives as well, that together we may be fit for the building up of the kingdom here on earth, ushered in by your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ, in whose name we make this and all prayers. Amen. Our hymn is number 132, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
ending. For some reason, we have uh, concluded this service about three minutes earlier than the 8.30 service. We need to sing another hymn, at least the first and the last stanza, so please turn the page to 131 as we sing, Come Christians, John to Sing. Go in grace and peace, and may we by our faith in you as Lord claim that power to reign in our lives, that we may know what it is to share and to live the good news of the gospel. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now and forevermore. allow for was the outgoing chairman of the budget and finance uh, who helped prepare this and so that will be the sequence Jack is here I know John person is somewhere in the audience so Betty uh, Jordan if you could come forward for the first part so we would be ready when everyone has the materials there's John <laughs> John why don't you come forward too uh, so you'll be in sequence and uh, maybe get Jack up here too uh, so we'll all be in the chancel area. There's some seats over here. John, if you want to sit over here. See, now the choir has the, uh, the district, well, but you all need the other, don't you? You all got it. Your forgiving love never turns away the repentant sinner. And therefore we praise you for the multitude of your blessings without limit or measure, which we receive every day from your gracious hand. We thank you, our God, that the sick were brought to Jesus that they might be healed. And he did not turn them away without his blessing. And we ask you today to look with pity upon all who come to you for healing of body mind, and spirit. And Lord, grant to all those who have suffered great loss, especially in the death of loved ones, a spirit of faith and courage, that they might gain new power to meet the challenges of the days to come, and to do so with steadfastness and patience, not grieving as those who have no hope, but remembering that in Christ there is resurrection and life. And our Father, you have placed us in families, parents and children and grandparents and relatives. We ask you now to help us to live together in true family love and give to us parents wisdom and guidance so that we might be able to train our children in the ways that lead to peace and righteousness and grant to children the attitude of respect and honor for their elders 
that their days may be full upon the earth. And Lord, you have called all of us to be faithful stewards and to dedicate our talents and our possessions and all the opportunities we enjoy to your service. Prepare us, we ask, to use wisely and well all the rich blessings that you have entrusted to our hands and make us faithful Christians. Teach us daily more of your truth, more of your love, more of yourself, and grant that our lives be made, be made strong by the Holy Spirit, that we might serve you gladly, faithfully, and courageously all our days. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying,